Right, um, my name's Sunil Hagler, good evening everyone, and, and welcome. It's great to see so many people here, it's great to see uh, a few teachers or uh, people involved in the school that have turned up as well tonight, especially given the weather. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors very quickly as well that have come along. Um, it's been fantastic that, that you've been able to come and, and uh, we hope to continue their relationship with you there. I want to thank the students who are going to help out tonight because uh, they're really keen and committed to show off how they're using technology um, in their learning. Uh, Darren covered most of the points actually that I'm going to that I'm going to talk about so I'm just going to breeze through and, and, and show you a few uh, a few pictures uh, along the way. Um, my role here as ICT coordinator sees me thinking about how how technology can be used in e-learning and and one thing's for sure is that you know technology it affects us all in, in, in very profound often often subtle ways and um, no more so than the birds really. Um, and, and you know, there will always be people that will be uh, maybe uh, negatively affected by technology, such as this man here. Um, but definitely not our kids. They're all going to be winners as far as the, the technology is concerned, because uh, it, it certainly does transform the learning. Um, oh, whoopsie daisy. So the old style of education that you guys are familiar with, some of you in the crowd may even recognise this photo. Maybe you're sitting up there in the, in the front on the left. Uh, that's, that's old school teaching, that's 20th century teaching. 21st century learning, uh, on there, there on the right, um, is about collaboration and that involves technology to a large extent. And times certainly have changed. I, I, I still remember these phones and uh, now we don't have a phone in our flat. We only have our mobile phones. So that, to me, really drives home how much things have changed for us. Now we've got this range of devices. We've got the Chromebooks up the top, tablets and iPod touches, all of which can be very useful learning devices in a child's learning and transform what they learn and how they learn. So when we talk about 21st century learning, I think a nice way to, talk, uh, to think about it is, is, is a, an overlapping of, of three key things. Firstly, as Darren mentioned, globalisation. The world is a very different place. That's largely a result of the internet uh, and how that's transformed our lives. And uh, I mean, I'm sure a number of you, if I ask you to put your hands up, you can remember around the first time that you actually went on the internet. For kids, they were born with the internet. Okay, well, There's a term that's loosely used of digital natives and therefore we are digital immigrants. And although that that term uh, falls out of favour with a few people, I think it hits the mark on a number of levels. These guys are born with technology, they expect technology to be involved in their learning and, um, and they're pretty quick at picking it up too. So globalisation on the one hand plays into this concept of 21st century learning. Uh, as well as that, we've got how people learn. Teachers understand better today how people learn and what it takes to, to maximise their educational achievement. Okay, we've got uh, specific pedagogies or teaching theories that we use, and they also overlap with uh, the innovations in technology, such as the ones you'll see here tonight, all of which feeds into this concept of 21st century learning, and it is markedly different from 20th century learning. Bit of a confusing diagram, but I just want to run through a few parts. The important thing is about how kids are affected uh, in their learning. So there are our kids in the middle, okay, they can, they can, they can work independently, uh, they can carry out teamwork, they can take part in projects, research, they can engage in sharing over forums and blogs. Now a lot of the stuff you guys will say, well we were doing that in the past as well, we were doing independent work, we were doing teamwork, but it's how they interact with things like the web here, which is just a fountain of knowledge for them, at their fingertips. Okay, with experts from outside that can, that can come into the classroom virtually to, to interact with them. Uh, we've got video content. Kids love making videos and you'll see some of them making it here tonight. Uh, we've got special apps that teachers can use which can help the kids to overcome their, their own ind uh, independent and individual problems in their learning. And all of this of course feeds into creative thinking and big thinking. And note here that I'm not uh, I'm not forgetting the teacher. The teacher plays a crucial role in facilitating this process. 
So being a global digital citizen, which is what we're trying to create out of the kids here, is about developing essential skills of the 21st century digital citizen. And uh, here's another way of looking at it. And again, these are things that you'll think, well, we were kind of doing this back when we were at school. Uh, we've got information fluency. They need to be fluent with information, and there's massive amounts coming at them uh, at, from the web. Media, so much media going on today. How do the kids sort through this and sift through this? Collaboration, working together, which is a crucial skill for a 21st century business, and kids can do that, and you'll see them doing that here tonight. Creativity, fluency, and then problem solving. Again, things we did, but done in unique and different ways today. Another advantage. The dog can't eat their homework anymore, so that's quite good. Now, of course, there are risks associated with technology, and unless you live in a bubble, you're going to know that about some of these risks that have been coming through in the media lately. Okay, kids using technology badly. Badly. And we don't want that because the risks associated with that are, are vast. Okay, so as soon as you put something on the web, it's there forever. Never goes away. Even if you shut down your Facebook account because you can't delete it, your photos are always there. So the risks associated with it mean that we need to educate our students how to use it. We need to help them embrace technology, not try and shun them away from it and, and then who knows what they do with it later. Uh, empower them to use it wisely and engage them in the process. And then hopefully we'll avoid things like, you know, posting our status updates uh, when we're in the back cave because that can be terribly dangerous. And I like this saying, okay, and I think this sums it up for me. If a child can't learn the way we teach, we should teach the way they learn. Okay, and, and, and that's a big shift in how we teach, from that teacher up the front of the classroom, filling up the empty vessels of the kids, versus thinking about how each individual kid learns. And technology allows us as teachers uh, to really individualise the learning process. That's all I'm going to talk about today. If you have any more questions about that, please feel free to come and talk to me at the end. Um, or sorry, or throughout as we do our roaming. But um, I'm now going to hand over back to the MCs and I uh, look forward to seeing you guys roaming and having a really good time with the tech. Thank you. There's no question that uh, the education has changed. Please, adults, raise your hand if you agree with that. Absolutely. Uh, so as teachers, what we're trying to do is we're trying to embrace that. And at Albany Junior, there's two ways we're trying to do this. The first is BYOD. Can some brave soul tell me what that stands for? Yes, sir, over in the back. Bring your own device. Bring your own device. And we also use Google Apps for Education. Please raise your hand once again, because I like to get the crowd involved. If you know what Google Apps for Education is, a couple of hands sporadically sort of, okay, fantastic. What I'm going to do is I'm going to explain a little bit about the practical side of Google Apps for Education, what we do at school. As you can see with the picture, the little white picture under the Google Apps for Education uh, title, you've got the likes of Gmail, Calendar, Drive, Docs, Sheets, Slides and Sites. All this might be, what are you talking about, Mr. Lawrence? And I'll explain these things to you and I'll explain to you why we like them here at Albany Junior. They're cloud-based. Cloud-based means that I can access that information, those files, anywhere, anytime, and on any device. So no longer do I have to have hard drives. I don't need CDs. I don't need USB drives. It can all be st uh, stored in this thing called the cloud. It allows users to create, share, collaborate, and comment on files in real time. Real time means now. So if I type in a document, and I share it with uh, a chap in the classroom beside me, we can see exactly what each other are doing at the same time. That is real time. It's, uh, it's security within a school. So we are housed, our Google Apps for Education account is housed within our AJHS domain. That means it is secure. So no one can access that information unless they obviously have the username and password, which our students do. 
It's an educational revolution changing the face of learning. That's what it's doing. And the smart people at Google are ever changing this technology. So one thing that might annoy you today, a week down the road, these guys probably have fixed it. And that's, that's as quick as it really does happen. They are quick, they are onto it, and it's changing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some little tasks today that I've done with a couple of my very capable students. I'll explain how Google Docs works first. If you can see that picture there, you see the coloured boxes with names in them. That could be two different people at any two different uh, places in the school working on a document. And that box indicates who's typing on that document. You can have up to 50 users on a document. So I can have two classes working on one document if I wish on a series of questions. The names obviously indicate the working areas and the beauty about Google Docs compared to the likes of Microsoft Word is this thing called sharing. If I share something with you, it means we can both work on that document as I said before in real time. There's no more cumbersome downloading the document, attaching it to a, uh, an email and sending it off to review for later on. It's in real time, it's happening now. So at the beginning of this, uh, this event, I got two students to find the best dressed female and the best dressed male. The question is, who could it be? So I left it in these gentlemen's capable hands to find out. So I did exclude, and you, Mr. Mr. Hagler. This lucky chap here was the best dressed male. Can you put up your hand, sir, so we can all see you? Wow. Slightly embarrassed, maybe. Where is he? There he is. There he is. Good on you. Describe why you think this particular male is the best dressed in the room. He's got a nice shirt. Well done. Jeans has the biggest smile in the room coming with his family. Fantastic. These lads here you can thank later on, sir. <laughs> the best dressed female. Well done, miss. May you raise your hand, please. There she is over in the corner. Well done. You have a beautiful smile. A lovely smile. They obviously really like your smile. And a wonderful looking son. <laughs> Fantastic. I just want to show you a short video. It's an evolution of a Google Doc growing. This isn't very long, it only takes 40 odd seconds. And it shows you a blank canvas, which is the Google Doc, and how it's evolved over time. The topic was sharks, a series of questions that 26, 27 students had to work on needed to be answered. There is no sound, but hopefully by the end of it you'll get what I mean.